Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Cheering crowd sound It's concerts Concerts that made us Concerts that made us Dot com <sighs> This is Nick Olsen from Son of Old And you're watching Concerts that made us And so it begins the end of the real, the end of the beginning, the beginning of the end. Nick, you're very welcome to the concerts that made us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's great. Now I'm looking forward to diving into your music over the next bit. Now, you've just released the album Echoes from a Silent Hill. It's been described as deeply personal and musically rich. Can you take us deeper into it if you can? Uh, 
yeah it, 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 I suppose it's a personal record in that uh, well, all music is, but <laughs> that particular album I was in Cape Town and um, uh, I was moving back to Germany, which was kind of forced circumstances. And um, it was a very difficult kind of transition into, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, kind of accepting new reality and trying to work around things. And um, I, I had all these songs that I'd been writing in Cape Town that I planned to record at one point, but then I just decided to get hold of this producer that I've worked with before um, and get into the studio and just do the record. And it was all done like while everything was happening. So I literally finished the record and, and, and not even, you know, a week later I was gone. Um, oh, yeah. Um, so it was it was kind of a, a, a kind of an intense time. I've immigrated before, and I'm, and I'm married to a German, so you know I know the the deal and the difficulties of traveling and living in different places. But um, yeah, it was it was a, a kind of an intense time. Yeah, the record. Yeah, yeah. did uh, did that take away from the record? Maybe I know you know it sounds like your focus wasn't fully on the the record when you have so much going on. No, we we focused on the album. We didn't. We just buried ourselves and and existed only in the studio, you know. So, um, you know, I would have to deal with certain things, of course, but not during the recording days. We had a thing at the time. I don't know how much it's still a problem in South Africa, where the the the, the lights are switched off at quite a regular basis, and that caused problems with studio time. So we'd have to work around that. So, um, you know, the songs I had already written. So it was just about creating the sounds in the studio and deciding making creative calls and tracking everything. Yeah. Yeah. And am I right in saying the producer you're speaking about was Theo Kraus? Yeah. He's a, he's a well-known South African producer. I mean, he's, he's worked with um, artists local and abroad and you know, yeah, he's done some cool things and um, he's got a fantastic studio and he really knows, knows what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. You're definitely in good hands. So, yeah, yeah. So it was it was a pleasure working with him. And I first I recorded some of my first uh, uh, recordings with him actually um, when I was eighteen years old or nineteen years old. So um, and then I recorded with him in two thousand and eight, and then again now. So we've got a long relationship. We've known each other during the various phases of our lives, and so there's a very close bond there, which is very cool. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Something else I want to speak about, which I'm sure you're probably sick of being asked about is you also have Foo Fighters Rami Jaffe on the album. How yes. did that come about and what was it like working with him? Well, I didn't really work with him in that, in that I didn't sit in the room with him and describe what we wanted. We, we did kind of, we had ideas of what we wanted him to do. Um, the reason why he's on the record is because um, Theo is good friends with him. Um, they connected through, I think it was initially through a tour the Foo Fighters were doing in in uh, South Africa. Um, and Theo looked after them for a day and rode motorbikes with um, with 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 um, Rami and 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 Dave and got to know them quite well. And then the relationship continued. And I Theo's feel like if he's looking for those like. Mellotron sounds, diff, you know, different types of effects and those real old vintage key sounds. Um, Rami is a master of that. He's kind of, that's that's his thing. He um, So he's played on a lot of different records of different people, I'm sure, over the years. And, um, yeah, he's kind of the go-to guy in that department. And so we sent him, so Theo sent him a little brief, sent him the tracks. He tracked it in his studio and then sent it back and then we put it together. I got to meet Rami, though, in Copenhagen, which was cool. Um, uh, you know, so 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 I've got to, got to know him a little bit. We didn't have much time because they were playing a, a show that night. So, um, yeah, I look forward to maybe spending more time with him in future. But uh, a very knowledgeable guy who's got a you know just a wealth of musical knowledge and experience. Um, you know, and those type of people are very valuable. That's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. When it came to the recording and production side yourself, is there any kind of memorable moments that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose um, doing the vocals was great. And I mean, yeah, I mean, it was just Theo and, and, and I in the studio, the two of us. And um, we were just buzzing off the whole creative process. It was, it was, uh, you know, you, it's hard to explain, but it was just a, 
the things things came out so quick we did that album so quickly and it, 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 everything flowed um yeah i mean memorable moments i mean we just spent a lot of time laughing smoking far too many cigarettes and uh enjoying you know recording a, 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 a kind of handmade rock and roll album <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a good time <laughs> yeah <laughs> Is there yeah. uh, is there any specific tracks on the on the record that you kind of gravitate more towards? Um, I like the song uh, "Sticks and Stones." I think it's quite cool. I think it's got a bit of a feeling of um, the Viagra Boys on there. Um, it's got that attitude, I think, which I really like, a bit of Beck style. Um, and then the song "Solo," which is out for a while now, that's done. That's been pretty well received, and that's a very special track, I think. Yeah, they all have their own kind of flavor, but I think those are probably my, my two favorites um, on the record. Yeah. 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 You mentioned you moved to Germany. From a musical point of view, how does Germany compare to South Africa? Um, well, I mean, it's the third largest market in the world, so that's big business, big money. South Africa doesn't have the same size economy and stuff, but South African artists and the South African music scene, I think, is across the board whatever genre you know people people are pretty committed to what they do because of the circumstances within which they work and um so i think people are people take when they do music and they do it you know they 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 put everything in and um i know more career musicians in south africa than i do here um not that there aren't career musicians here i'm just just i don't know maybe that's my south africa connection but i know people that have done quite a lot of stuff and played in bands here of course um yeah so it's a different scene it's different altogether the people you know um people in uh people in germany are yeah i don't know it's hard to say i mean with the amount of people here there's not that much great stuff in my opinion (laughs) 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 but you know i think it comes along with having a also a it's not comfortable for everyone i know everyone has troubles and the you know whatever the world is changing but i mean it's a pretty different society to to living in South Africa, you know. Um, and I think creatively um, it, it comes out. And I think sometimes having a bit of a rough time helps helps the music a bit. <laughs> Maybe it's all too comfortable. Yeah. People have lots of expensive equipment and stuff. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, look, but uh, on the other hand, I mean, geez, you know, the music now, I'm, I'm talking from a perspective of someone who's 44 years old, you know, there's everyone in there. And their uncle has got a guitar and a recording device and tracks music. And there's certainly lots of talented people out there. But but it's yeah, it's a different scene. It's a lot more cutthroat, I would imagine. Maybe um, I used to be a bit involved in it. You know, in Munich, I had an indie label here. Um, I did a record with Steve Albini um, in 2011 and was playing and seen here a bit. And it was very, very cool, but it's changed. It's changed a lot now, everything. And I haven't really found my feet, to be totally honest, um, in Germany, musically. Yeah. I was I was going to ask, is there much of a, a scene for kind of rock, singer, songwritery stuff? Because it's not exactly the first thing you think of when you think of Germany. Yeah, there, there, there is. And I think there's some German songwriters. I think uh, a German uh, music, uh, they put a lot more emphasis, I find, generally, uh, uh, on lyrics. Um, and, and so of course there's that, that connection and nuances with the language. And I think that means a lot to, 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 to the audiences here. Um, whereas, you know, in English, often it's a lot more abstract and up to interpretation. Um, you know, unless you're, I don't know, there's some artists that I suppose are pretty blatant, but, um, yeah. And, and there is, there's definitely a scene here, but I suppose, but, um, it's the same you know, it's the same type of uh, uh, industry, the same type of struggles, the same type of stories you hear about music and what it means to make music these days that you hear everywhere. That's kind of universal. And I find the genres have broken down. You know, I mean, you've listened to these, the algorithms, is, I don't know if I can swear on this pod- podcast. No, you can really, work away. <laughs> they've really fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> can I drink as well? <laughs> yeah, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you know, as well, for anyone not aware, you have a, a long history in the South African music scene. You were the front man of the award-winning rock band Perez. 
Then you launched your solo career in 2008. You took a break, then you came back to it in 2020. After so long in the industry, what drives you these days compared to when you started out? I think what drives me these days is to realizing that music for me is part of my existence. And if I don't do it, it's a problem um, on many levels. When I was young, I was motivated to become in a popular band and do well and have success. And, and you know, when you're in your 20s, you, you're driven by all sorts of, all sorts of things, uh, other things. But um, now I'm just trying to find a way to sustain something so that it's uh, just to have a voice in, in, in music, you know, to put out records and to find people that connect with the sound. Um, when I realize that there's nothing of that, um, you know, um, then, you know, maybe I will, I will, I won't be investing so much effort in it, I suppose, but I will always do it, you know, so it's kind of more of a spiritual thing now, I suppose. Um, but I, I, the, the thing that's connected those two areas is that I take, when I do an album, I take it seriously. I don't do it with the intention of, oh, I just need to be creative and put something out there. And that's, that's enough for me. Uh, you know, I, I listen to, I'm a fan of music and I don't want to put out music that I don't think is worthwhile sending to people to listen to, you know, if it's not, if it's, you know, if it's just, yeah. Um, so yeah, the motivation has kind of changed. I suppose the bar is set differently to what it was when I was younger. And naturally my audience is older because music has changed. I don't play like, you know, I don't play um, the type of music that, um, that people are into now, I suppose very much. Um, and it's a bit of a challenge um, now kind of not a challenge, but I suppose, you know, classic rock is defined or, 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 or certain sounds are defined and they have the, and people harp back on that. People don't continue creating like old school sounding records, you know, because I was kind of inspired by Pink Floyd a bit on this album, you know, as well. And um, just some of their sounds and their, their their feeling and those old sounds. And yeah, it was, yeah, it was different. So it's a long winded answer. No, I like it. I like it. It's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. Now the, the podcast is called Concerts That Made Us. So I have to ask you some concert related questions. Yes. First off. As a concert goer, what concerts would you say have made you? What really impressed me, um, what really blew me away, I think, was seeing Tori Amos play at Roskilde the Festival in 1998. Um, she, yeah, she was fantastic. And Dr. John played that same year as well, the, the pianist, um, singer, or the late singer. Um that had a big impact on me. Um, those are concerts I actually attended, you know, mm -hmm. in South Africa, often we were watching, you know, at that time, you know, there weren't many bands coming across. So you would see local bands and local acts. So a lot of the local bands in South Africa, of course, really motivated me. I remember seeing the band, they, they called the Springbok Nude Girls, which was Theo's band. They're kind of a cult rock band, you could say. I've actually had them on before. I've had Arno on before, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, so 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 they really like I was so they they're kind of I think they're about ten because Theo's of a slightly older generation, like ten years older. Um, so yeah, um, that band had a big influence in watching them play live. Um, there was a band called Boo in the old days that was kind of as well. They were kind of a three piece band, and the singer was a bass player, and he had his little microphone here, and he made weird noises. And but they were such a tight knit conceptual outfit that was that was a very big inspiration. Um, and then, you know, quite recently, and it's kind of pretty weird, but I think one of the most inspiring concerts I've seen of late would be, um, ACDC at Nuremberg, um, in Nuremberg. I was in the golden circle for that. And I never grew up really being a huge ACDC fan, but of course I, the music is, is, you know, I know it and I appreciate it very much. But it was just uh, so amazing to see these people play this music with so much power at the age that they were in. And, and that really gave me like, it sounds ridiculous, I know, and cheesy, but I was like, yeah, you know, these guys are still doing it. I mean, granted, they're making a lot of money and everything out of their music. <laughs> and they probably have like blood infusions every day or some shit <laughs> <laughs> to keep them going. Things that yeah. I don't have. I have Polana beer. <laughs> um, and trying to keep my stomach waistline 
um, yeah, from from going out of control. That's my biggest concern <laughs> these days. <laughs> but nevertheless, you know, it was just that you could see that they were really into it. It was really cool. Um, and then, of course, I saw the Foo Fighters on the side of the stage at Roskilde um, recently at their last tour um, when when I met um, Rami, and that was that was really. That was kind of like a closing experience in a weird way, you know. I, I had my cousin with me who had attended every single every single Roskilde festival, and um, you know he's he's getting older now, of course, and 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 he was like, oh, "This will be the this will be the last festival." But we we both were standing on the main stage, on the side stage with the main act, enjoying the gig, and he says, "You're not going to beat that that festival experience like that." So it was just, um, so yeah, that was that was super cool. But um, yeah, it, that was more of a reflection than something that made me. I would say, yeah. I like it. I like it. Some good yeah. ones there. Good ones. Yeah. Now, for any listeners that haven't been lucky enough to catch one of your shows, what are they like? Give us the full experience if you can. So it varies. You know, sometimes I play on acoustic guitar and vocals, and it's just myself. And then I kind of experiment a little bit with sounds and building a wall of sound with an acoustic guitar and then supporting the music with that. And that's kind of its own thing. I find it's the easiest way to communicate the songs um, is to strip it all down. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, with band stuff, you know, I, I kind of aim to, to, you know, it's, it's, it's it kind of sounds like on the record, you know, um, we, 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 I'm not a very um, like flashy performer. Um, um, but, uh, I, 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 I just want to be sincere when I, when I perform, that's the most important thing. Um, and so I think when I perform, I don't make people feel uncomfortable. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, when someone says, come watch my gig and you go there and you're like, fuck and hell. And then you have to say something at the end of it um yeah um yeah it's not like it's yeah it's it's a comfortable cozy environment that's what i always like and that's kind of what my concerts are like um that's kind of the feeling i like to put across yeah sounds like a sounds like a good time good time yeah. at least you're not uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. and if you think of all the gigs that you've played over your entire career is there one that sits above the rest? You know, it just couldn't have got any better. Yeah, I, I, I played a gig at, in a venue in Munich um, uh, around 2011, 10, 11, um, in, a fest, in a hall called the Mufatala. And it was a fantastic gig because the drummer I was working with at the time, we had been playing so much together and we'd finished, we'd come back from Chicago from recording with, with the late Steve Albini. And, um, uh, we were opening up for a band that was one of these, they were pretty, it was their, their gig. So it was sold out show and they were obviously very popular, but I didn't know much about them. Um, but they had a lot, like they had like a very big, um, setup, um, you know, synths and fucking wind section and guitars and beards and all sorts of shit. <laughs> and, um, um, I have a beard, but anyway, um, but, uh, we kind of got there as a two piece. It was a two piece band, and we set up on the stage. And we, of course, had to set up our drum kit separately and quickly get it all, you know, on and off the stage as quick as we could. Could, but I had this massive stack amp, um, and the sound was fantastic. And it was it was just pure raw power that came across. Um, um, and yeah, that gig was probably, it was the last gig we would play together actually, because I would move back to South Africa and he moved to California to play, played in a band called Obliterations and the, I think they're called the Pink Mountain Tops. Is the name of the band. I might be wrong, but anyway, he, he had some gigs in California and he moved away and yeah, that was a very, that was, that was something that really stood out. And then when I was in Perez, we played um, a Splashy Fen, which is an old festival in KwaZulu-Natal. It's in the Drakensberg, which is a lot of green rolling hills and, you know, very kind of farm-like. It's in the mountains and as well, there's mountains there. It's really beautiful. And um, that was our first gig as Perez. And we actually got signed that night straight away. The guy who became our manager and label and did everything for us. And he did a lot in South Africa. He um, 
he basically went up to said, you're not talking to anyone else. It's done. You're with us. And he gave us salaries, got us a house in Johannesburg, <laughs> moved us up there. And yeah, and that gig we worked on for such a long time. It was like we were going to come on with a bang and it was a headline slot, which we could wangle our way into because we had been in the music scene and um, <laughs> we were pretty, pretty, you know, we were pretty fucked when we played but in a good way like we could play it wasn't like mm -hmm. that but it was just it was special it was surreal yeah um yeah so that, that those are the two 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 concerts i'd say um that stick with me i like it i like it i'm not surprised to stick with you here's a bit of a fun one if we flip that around the worst gig you've played everything went wrong and how did you overcome it the worst gig I played was with Perez. It was after our second album. And I had been approached by a band called the Parlotones to join them. Um, because uh, I was kind of the primarily the 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 songwriter and Perez and everyone knew me as, as as a strong songwriter, or at least that's what they thought. Um so um uh they hired me, but we still had some gigs going and um we had to finish off a Perez gig and we'd done an album with Theo actually. And, you know, it, it, the first album we did took off big time. This album had, um, it's, it's, I think it's the better of the better album, but, um, and I think a lot of music listeners would agree. Um, but, um, it was just a different time. We were playing rock and roll music that they weren't ready for in South Africa. I felt at that point, it would have done very well, much better in Europe and other places. But so there was a lot of, you know, the back story is, you know, there was a lot of belief in it and then it didn't work and it was just, and I had been then asked to join this band and then the pile turns was on the same label as what Perez was on. And it was just a fucking, it was a bit of a weird one. And I, I arrived at the gig and, <laughs> and the bass player was on another planet. Um, like nowhere. He was fucking nowhere. That's as much as I can say. And that it was very clear. He was nowhere. And we were all just like, fuck it, let's just play. It'll be fun. And he got on stage. And we were all eventually so, it was a very surreal experience. And um, he couldn't plug in the, his guitar, um, his bass oh. guitar. And when he did eventually get it in and the, the drummer started playing, he started playing a different song to what we were playing. And when I mean different, I mean different timing, different fucking key, like completely fucking different. <laughs> And we had all these hardcore Perez fans that were there that could just see that they were witnessing something special. <laughs> they were witnessing a band like coming completely out at the seams. It was just like, and yeah, I mean, the drummer that we had, um, he, and he's a fantastic drummer. He he didn't talk to us. Like, he didn't speak to us again for like months. <laughs> it was like it was done. It was just uh, yeah, and and that was a, that was the worst gig. Um, yeah, <laughs> bad gigs come with those type of stories, you know, she's mm. you know, happening with, I don't know, Jane's addiction recently with people yeah. out on stage. It's like, it looks so comical when you're the viewer and you think, God, but, um, you know, it's another side when you're on that, that edge of the fence and you're in this little world and everyone's looking in at it and suddenly, um, you know. The, the problems in that world or the difficulties are just exposed fucking clear for everyone <laughs> to witness. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. Yeah. With, uh, with so many years passed then, what are the hopes or chances of Perez reuniting even for a one-off gig? Um, well, you know, I'm planning to tour South Africa next year and we kind of um, met the singer. I'm very, um, I'm also close with the other guys, but you know, uh, with Adam, the bass player as well, but also but particularly Matt. And it was the, the thing that made Perez special was we had two vocals and Matt has a bit of a, a more of a kind of husky voice. Um, he's like, he's like your singer's singer. I have a slightly different voice, although it's changed a little bit now that it got older. Um, and that was the special thing. So, so um, we 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 played a, like a reunion show, uh, like one or two gigs. We played some festivals um, two years ago, I think it was. And then um, I'm going to go back and tour. And Matt was like, "Okay, cool, let's hook this up." And he's going to play for me and sing and backing vocals and stuff and play guitar with these for this album. He's the biggest fan of this record. He says like he's a huge fan of it. So 
um, we were kind of mooting the idea of, you know, um, perhaps doing like a, a, a pocket band, Perez pocket band type thing and and actually play some of the songs. Um, we did plan to do a record at one stage, but uh, it was just uh, everyone is in, you know, in, in different places. And, you know, I also put a lot of effort and time to write music and I want to be able to kind of, I don't want it to be just written and put out there and not, and that's it, you know, like, like I said, even with this record, you know, I, I do it with the intention of trying to grow and build more, build a bit of a fan base. Yeah. 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 True. Yeah. True. Now, before we dive into the last couple of questions, then we just heard about the tour in South Africa. Is there any other future plans you can tell us about maybe a next album or gigs that are closer? Um, yeah, I'm going to be playing a little bit around here. Definitely. Of course, I'd love to come to Ireland and I think, I think that I, I would make an effort to do that. I just need to probably just start to do some more research into how that's possible. Um, particularly because um, I, I live here and uh, it, it, it's a uh, EU, you know, it's part of the EU and it's English speaking. That's really important. You know, I it think. helps. <laughs> um, it does help. And on my, on Spotify, it seems, you know, you can kind of break down where I have, I have quite a, a lot of listeners in Ireland, I'd say. Um, so, yeah, that's something that's on the cards. Australia as well. Um, I'd like to go and play 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 in Australia. And Adam, the 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 bass player from Perez, he, he, we're talking about lining up a tour that side. And then I just pull musicians in over there. So Adam would play bass or, or, or with me, and then just like Matt will play when I go to South Africa, and then just get local musicians. So it's more cost effective, I suppose. I don't really have a band as such. So um, it'll be Australia, um, uh, Germany, South Africa, and then um, Ireland. And, and I'm not just saying this because of this podcast, but it, I was, um, it was something I've been looking into um, because I'm looking for places where I where um i think the music will resonate in particular you know and, and i feel that 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 it would work there you know um the uk is completely out the fucking question to be totally honest <laughs> right. uh, just because of brexit and and the missions of that and it's just i mean there's artists that are that are actually doing well that even here and there that don't cross the come across because it's just absolutely impossible um financially yeah yeah yeah, that's actually, I feel like in my last four or five interviews, Brexit has come up, you know, and everyone just, it's a killer. Like it just cut, shut off so many doors for music. Yeah, I mean, there was a band called The Wave Pictures that used to tour Europe a lot. I played, we toured with them, a son of old in an old constellation, like 2000, I don't know when that was, in the 2000s. And they still tour a lot in, in the UK and um, um, they come to Spain, but they don't come to Germany. Um, I think the the whole endeavor is just, you know, I think yeah, concerts concerts are under threat and indie concerts are under threat, and a lot of people that are into the you know kind of smaller gig venues, so an older crowd, um, you know, and I would say older, I mean thirty five and above, a lot of people aren't used to this idea that you have to pre sale tickets, um, for a fucking pub gig, you know, I mean. And then they want so many pre-sales and, they, they, and so for traveling bands at least, you know, whereas like in the old days when I lived here or, you know, in the 2000s, it was, you know, you saw that was on the list and you'll go, cool, that's, he's playing tonight. You make the call right there and then, and you go to the gig and gigs were full, you know, and there were no pre-sales. And I think that's all changed. And that's because of the, yeah, I think it's kind of the, 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 the way these ticket selling um, institutions have hijacked the small venues, you know, so it's fucked up, fucked it up, big time. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of like looking to play. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I'll probably, you know, I, I'm, I'm, look, it's not my problem. I'm not big enough to be concerned too much about that now. But um, yeah, there's a cool venue here called Substance in Munich, which is um, I'm going to go and play it. Which is, there's a lot of pretty historical venues here, and, and um, my wife saw um, Pearl Jam there before Ten came out. Just before Ten came out in front of thirty oh, people, Nirvana played there. Sonic Youth played there. Um, all sorts of bands from over the years have played this venue and the stage is still there and it's all original. Now I think the music has to stop at 10.30 or something, which is kind of mm. fucking weird. <laughs> um, but uh, but I'm going to play some gigs at those places and kind of, yeah, it sounded kind of, uh, uh, and then some festivals next year as well. Yeah. Nice, nice. We're going to be busy, so 
We'll um we'll dive into the last couple of questions or a couple of random fun ones. First off, before b- besides music, what are you currently obsessed with? I, I, um, I, I'm not really obsessed with anything. Eh? I'm <laughs> obsessed with trying to not like drink myself to death. Right. <laughs> it's a good obsession. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm obsessed. Yeah, no, that's not bad. I'm not, I'm not quite there yet. But um, yeah, I, I, I work a hell of a lot as a tour guide here to fund everything. So I do like, I'm, I'm not, you know, so I'm obsessed, I suppose it seems with, <laughs> with, Fucking Third Reich history because I work in that that field and from from a tour perspective. So, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm, it's a yeah, it's not a passion, but it's something that I'm kind of into quite a lot. I would say, yeah, history. <laughs> so that's actually very interesting. Being over there and needing to know all that stuff and looking into it, I think I feel yeah. like I'd actually get lost looking into that. I'd be so engrossed wanting to find out more yeah. and more. No, no, you know? it, it it is. I mean, it is interesting, and I've I've got much more into it than I was when I did it when I was younger. Yeah, mm. yeah. The uh, the next one, it's a bit odd. If you had to spend twenty four hours locked in a room with any musician from history, who would it be? Jeez. Um, it would be, I think it would be David Bowie. Right. I like it. I like it. What would you hope to learn from David Bowie? Well, you know, there's a lot of other musicians that I really look up to that I'd love to have loved to see, but you know, David Bowie just seems to be such a, an, an, he's a type of guy you'd want to talk to. He's got so much wisdom on so many levels, uh, you know, not just from his music side. So if I'm locked in a room with someone you know, I wouldn't want to be locked in a room with Paul McCartney. <laughs> you know? Yeah, John Lennon. You know, you'd feel like you'd land up. You know, it would just be uncomfortable um, mm. at some point because you know he would start getting really pissed off. And David Bowie, I imagine, would be the type of guy that would have said, you know, um, okay, this is a situation. Let's make the most of it. And let's, what's yeah. going on? <laughs> let's talk or something. You know, yeah, it would be. Yeah. I would feel safe with Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> I like it I like it <laughs> and the uh, the final question so what's your go-to album an album you constantly go back to God um uh jeez an album I constantly go back to and God you must have heard this so much so just you can roll your eyes as OK Computer Radiohead okay okay <laughs> um it's just, uh, yeah, something that I can go back to and listen to from beginning and end and be taken away. You know, it's a, it's a great record. Um, yeah, I like some of their later stuff, of course, as well. But that one is just, um, I don't know, it's quite outstanding. I think when they played that show, when they were when they were like really happening with that record, they were playing in, in London or something and everyone was there. You know, the who's who from music history was there to watch them perform this record. You know, I think it was... Uh, and something that happened in my, my kind of my my musical lifetime. So yeah, that's a record I go back to. I like it. I like it. Listen, Nick, this was really fun. Then thanks, a million. Cool. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the sh- on the show. <laughs> to the call boy you're welcome to decline welcome to the sadness sadness of the mind she cowers in the bathroom of the past embroidered on her mind Cannons of suffrage Come back Prince, I wanna Shout out, shout outs won't prevail To a chorus of disaster, suffering
Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. And if you're interested in signing up the Band Builder Academy, use the link in the show notes below and enter the code CONCERTS and you'll receive 10% off. So, until next time, keep rocking. Hey, hey, what are you guys still doing there? The show is over. It's over. You can go home. Go on. We'll see you next time. We'll be here.